All right, in this video, we're going to do our first actual hypothesis test. So we're going to, again, talk about the logic of hypothesis testing and talk about what a hypothesis test about a population proportion is. And um, we're actually, I don't know if we're ever going to do the last one. Ooh, I don't know if I have that in the video. I know I have some online lessons about that last one, but uh, maybe we'll toss in one here, too. So um, we have this example that we use. We look at the success of students in Math 98 about 55 percent were successful so wondering how unusual that is so there's some language here if we look at uh, the probability of having 78 or more successful students or the probability of having a proportion of at least 78 out of 88 we call that the p-value the p-value is a hypothesis test language it's how likely of observing your result or more extreme so the p-value is the probability probability of observing your sample statistic as extreme or more extreme than the one observed assuming the null hypothesis was true. Now there's a little thing we can infer from p-value. If we have really small p-values, if they're really really unusual event, uh, we can say there's very strong evidence um, and then there's this kind of criteria here. If you have a p-value greater than 0.1 that really means there's not a lot of evidence to support your alternative hypothesis, but there is a huge caveat here. We talked about in the first video that these hypothesis tests can be affected by sample size. Big sample sizes can lead to very small, even though the difference might not practically be that big. So all of these assume we really can only compare p-values if we have if they're all the same sample size. So I can't say that one result is more extreme than another if the sample sizes are different because those probabilities are affected by the sample size. So sample size is huge here. Um, we also talk about something that we won't get into in this class, but you talk about the effect size, which is really valuable. So you say, oh, okay, I have some good evidence to support my alternative hypothesis, but how big was the effect and can we measure the, the size of that effect? Then that can tell you how powerful those results are. All right, so let's look at hypothesis tests regarding a population proportion. Here's the basic process, and we're actually going to use this process for the next few chapters every, anytime we do a hypothesis, hypothesis test. Uh, the first thing we do is state very clearly what our null and alternative hypotheses are. And we're going to do a few examples, I think one in this video and then one in each of the following videos. Um, there's some in the online lessons as well. Uh, step two, decide on your level of significance. That's your probability of a type 1 error. So basically, how, what's your threshold for how comfortable you are being okay, being wrong, saying the alternative hypothesis is true and really you just observe something unusual. Um, that level of significance kind of depends on the consequences. So if you're doing a test and you're trying to see if a particular drug um, causes cancer, like not a cancer drug to help you, but some drug for stomach illnesses or something, and there's a suspicion that it causes cancer. And so, actually, let me do it the other way. Um, I'm trying to think of examples here on the fly. So, the level of significance, how you determine that, depends on the consequences of making that mistake, of saying the alternative hypothesis is true when really it isn't. So like if you're looking for, again, the safety of a drug, you think this drug might cause cancer, you're probably okay being wrong sometimes, like saying, ooh, this drug causes cancer, let's not give it to anyone, when it really doesn't cause cancer. So you're probably okay with that rather than like you don't want the reverse mistake of saying nope everything's fine status quo it doesn't cross cancer when really it does so you probably want you're, you're okay with a relatively high level of significance maybe alpha equal 0.1 um, that if you get something you know 10 percent of the time that could just happen unusually but if you say you know what yeah this only this happened eight percent of the time and that could just happen randomly but the fact that this only happens eight percent of the time that this many people get cancer that tells me let's not give this drug so you're okay with that level of significance um, on the other hand say you're doing uh, a trial and you're looking for evidence of guilt um, whatever it is that you're measuring and so the alternative hypothesis innocent until proven guilty or the sorry the null hypothesis you assume the status quo innocent until proven guilty 
And the alternative is that they're going to be guilty and sentenced to the death sentence or, or life in prison, depending on which state you live in. Um, so in that case, if you say that they're guilty and they're really not, you put an innocent pr person in prison. So you want a very low level of significance there. You want to be really certain that that person is guilty. Now we say beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, what's a reasonable doubt? Alpha equal point zero zero one, whatever. You know, whatever that is, you want to be sure. You don't want to mess around. You don't want alpha of point one. You don't want ten percent of people who could be over there just randomly going to prison, right? You want that probability very very low. So. Usually in the homework and in tests, this probability is given to you, but in practice, as a researcher, you have to decide what that is yourself. Um, usually for academic research, 5%, that unusual threshold is pretty, is pretty typical. Um, but in medical research or other areas where that, uh, the consequences of that making that mistake are really important, it can go either way, then you might change that level of significance and decide what you want. Uh, then we'll talk about computing the test statistic and determining the p-value, and we're going to use StatCrunch for this. And then what you do is you say, you know what, if I observe something, if the probability of what I observed is small, is less than my level of significance, I'm going to reject the null hypothesis and say, you know what, the alternative hypothesis is true. And then you state your conclusion. So for a population proportion, in fact, all of these steps, all these steps one through six are going to be the same for every hypothesis test. Um, and then what's going to be different statistics. So for a population proportion, the test statistic is a z, and hopefully you recognize this here, p hat minus the mean over the standard deviation. So that's a z. Um, we're going to do, I think, the first one we might do by hand, but most of them we'll just use StatCrunch to calculate. So let's go back to our example about the success rates here. Um, we've got about 55% um, are usually successful and we're wondering if these students in this group are more likely to succeed. So we have our null hypothesis is that the proportion is 55 percent uh, and our alternative is that it's more than that. And then we have this 5 percent level of significance so alpha is 0.05 and then if we look at our, our data here we have 88 students, 78 were successful so we have a sample proportion of x over n, 78 over 88. So let's look at those steps. State the null and alternative hypotheses. Okay, so null, the proportion is 55%. Alternative is that it's more than 55%. Level of significance was given to us. That's alpha equal 0.05. Um, computing the test statistic and determining the p-value. Let me jump over to StatCrunch. Uh, I have some data up for a later example. Later example. We're going to go to stats, proportion stats, one sample with summary and so we have 78 out of 88 78 were successful out of 88 and our null hypothesis is that it's 0.55 our alternative oh, let's see it's using HA here I think you're I don't know which one your book uses H1 or HA I don't know I've seen both um, is that our proportion is greater than that and then if we compute it gives us that really, really, really small p-value. We already talked about that. It's really, really, really small. So if we go here, we did, that was the test we did, 78 out of 88. Uh, and then we had this really small p-value. So the test statistic is that z is about 6.34. Now, think about what you know about z. Think about how many standard deviations are each way, pretty much all the way out to the edge. And then you have 6.34. Right, that is a really, really extreme, <laughs> unusual observation. So, step five is five is reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is less than the level of significance. And this say, in this case, yes, definitely reject the null hypothesis. We definitely have enough evidence to support our um, alternative. So, in this case, there is enough evidence, and in fact, you could even say there's very strong evidence. This is a pretty small sample size. And so even with this small sample size, only 88 students, they have a very, very small probability. So very strong evidence to support the claim that the proportion of students who are in a 3.5 or higher in high school are successful in Math 98 is higher than the typical 0.55. Uh, to give you a little visual of that, 
here's the normal Z distribution. We have our Z test statistic. And so if we calculate that, 78 out of 88 minus the null proportion, 0.55, and then over the standard deviation, you get about 6.34, which you have to extend your table, your chart over to get to the 6.34. And the probability of being greater than that is basically zero. So this is what we're saying. This is basically, it, the probability of this happening is basically zero. This is essentially an impossible event. So these students really probably have a much higher chance of succeeding in Math 98. All right, um, let's talk a little bit about the binomial here. Um, I don't have any slides on it, but if we're looking at probability of success, this is really a binomial distribution. So maybe the conditions for using the normal distribution aren't met. Well, you can also use the binomial distribution. One of the reasons why we do the normal distribution is it, it makes some later analysis a little bit easier, but really it's a holdover from having to do the tables and binomial probabilities were difficult to calculate, but that isn't a problem anymore. So we could just treat this as a binomial. What's the probability of 78 or more being successful out of 88? Because really they're either, either they succeed or they don't. Now we're assuming independence of these students and they are all you no, know, they could be in the same class together, so that could be fuzzy. Um, there's a fixed number of trials, there's 88 trials, and the probability of success, we are assuming it's constant, 0.55, if we're just picking a random student. Now, each student has his or her own probability of success, but randomly, we don't know, you know, we don't know what that student is, so that student has that overall probability of success. So, if we go back to StatCrunch, we could do the binomial and do n is 88, um, p is 0.55, and find the probability of being at least 78. And we get basically the same thing. You know, look at where 78 is. <laughs> it's, it's way off the table. So we could just use binomial probability here. Um, why go to all that trouble of doing the other one? There's, no, I don't have a great reason for you. Either one will work. Um, the reasoning behind it is a little fuzzy at this point, so we really want to be flexible with both. We want to find the probability of observing that sample or, in this case, or more because we were greater than. Uh, and so you can do that with binomial or using the uh, distribution of p hat. Either one, they're basically the same p value, right? Here are the p values. So here's the binomial probability, and our, which is essentially zero and then our p-value is less than 1 in 10,000, so they are very comparable. All right, uh, that is it for um, the video for 10.2, and next time, next video, we'll talk about the doing hypothesis testing about the population mean.